go. There's oh, Nate. There's his brother. And what's his name? I think it's Sam. Sam. Yeah. Sam. There's there's me. We've got lots of people here. So welcome everyone. We get to yeah. the big screen. Hey. We've got lots of people, which is always exciting. I'm gonna we're gonna have some discussion uh, later on, which I, I really want to hear from everyone on. I'm gonna invite you to make sure that you're muted. Uh, here just at the beginning um, as we get set up. Look up there. But it's, a, it's exciting to see everybody. Big screen. Oh, so you can see my uh -huh. line of light. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you want to unmute now? Again, yeah, I would, I would love it if people mm -hmm. could mute themselves here just so we can all get settled. See Don? I don't know how. I think I got you there, Judith. Can yeah, thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's so exciting to see all of your faces here. Okay. And um, I'll just introduce myself to start with. My name is Reverend Nate Klug, and I'm the pastor at Arlington Community Church in Kensington. And really excited to welcome everybody for this Lenten study on reparations. In a minute, we're going to be joined by Dr. Sam Klug, my brother, and he's put together a really wonderful um, presentation that will take us through some of the history and significance of okay. that word reparations. And, a, and um, but before we do that, I just thought it would be nice to, um, since we do have a bigger group and we have folks coming from all over, I think Lots of people here are involved in one of the churches in the East Bay that is taking up this Black Home Ownership Reparations Project. And so maybe we can just really quickly go through um, and I will call on you and you can just say where you're coming from today. You can just say your name and where you're coming from and that'll just help us know who's joining. I don't know if that did. And so, uh, Faith and Roger, will you start us off? Faith and Roger Abel. And you're and we're Arlington Community Church. And uh, Charles and Alice. First Congregational, Berkeley. Hi, Charles and Alice. Nice to see you. And um, how about Michael and Elizabeth? Yes, we're Mike and Elizabeth. Kirsten from uh, Arinda Community Church. Hi, you guys. Nice to see you. And uh, how about you, Doug Leach? Yes, Doug Leach from Danville Congregational Church. Hi, Doug. Thanks for joining us. And um, how about you, Kit Dunbar? Hey, greetings from First Church Berkeley again. <laughs> Good to see everyone. Thank you for doing this. Hi, Kit. It's great to have you. And you know what? We actually have too many people to go through and do everybody, but that, that's a really good um, sample, I think, of the different communities um, that are joining us on this call. Um, so I thought we would just start by um, framing our time with a little bit of scripture. We're just going to look at a few verses here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my screen. And this is just two verses from the prophet Isaiah, but you can see I've divided it up into uh, four little sections. And maybe we could just hear this read by four voices here. So I'm gonna just call on four of you and you can each read one of these, one of these phrases. Um, Ruth, will you start us off with the Lord? What do we say? Ruth. Ruth. Sorry, Nate, I just put a pretzel in my mouth, but I'll do my best. Oh, good. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And Eleanor, will you read for us next? 
Oops. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. And Ron Yord, would you read for us next? Get that? You weren't muted. Did that come through? Can you try it one more time? Okay. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. And Sarah Lafert, would you read for us the last little bit? You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. Mm, I like that. Amen. Thank you all. So uh, a few weeks ago in our previous Bible study, a few of us were talking about this word repair. And um, I asked some folks what came to mind when you heard that word repair. Somebody talked about um, needing to fix their front steps. Somebody talked about uh, relationships and how we have these relationships that we need sometimes to do some repair work in. And we're gonna kind of continue this consideration of the word repair by talking today about reparations, uh, a word of course that has its roots in that word repair. And uh, we're gonna specifically talk about this idea of reparations um, with regards to African-Americans, black people in the United States and um, some of the ideas and history of um, both for and against um, this, uh, this idea. So I'm gonna introduce my brother now, uh, Sam, and just a word or two about his biography. Um, Sam is a professor of history, specializing in African-American history and thought. He lives in Washington, DC. And uh, his first book, The Internal Colony, is forthcoming, not too long from now, from the University of Chicago Press. So Sam, it's so awesome to have you with us. I think you're gonna uh, spend about 15 or 20 minutes uh, talking to us and teaching us, and then we'll open things up for a, a bit of discussion. Wonderful, thank you so much, Nate, uh, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for, for inviting me. It's, it's great to be um, back uh, with, with some of you. Um, it's my second, second visit to, to ACC on, on Zoom. Um, but, but my first visit with, with many of you. Uh, so it's, it's really wonderful to be here. I'm so, um, so grateful for the invitation. Um, and, and yeah, happy to, to talk a little bit on this, on this topic. Um, so um, what I'm gonna do is, is talk probably for, yeah, ho hopefully I'll, I'll keep it to about 15 um, minutes, maybe 20. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about sort of the history of um, the movement for reparations uh, among African Americans, and um, a little bit about some of the debates within that movement, um, and then a little bit about sort of arguments uh, against this idea of, of reparations, um, and, and just sort of give us a, a little bit of historical perspective um, on this, this idea, since I know it's, it's a big theme for all of you um, this, uh, this Lent. Um, so I'm gonna share a sc my screen, and I have a, you know, a few slides that I'll kind of take us through um, as we go. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about uh, is the sort of origins of the movement for uh, reparations uh, for Black Americans. Um, and then, as I say, I'm going to move into some of the debates within this movement, arguments against it, and then sort of close by just uh, a way of thinking about reparations. So the origins of the movement for uh, what, what's come to be known as, as reparations uh, really lies in the Civil War and Reconstruction period. Um, as uh, formerly enslaved African Americans sought compensation for the, you know, the years of unpaid toil uh, that they had suffered and, and worked. Um, and this took a number of different forms, but one kind of key moment in this sort of early history actually happened during the Civil War. Uh, and it happened as uh, the Union Army uh, was marching through South Carolina and Georgia. And um, there was actually a military order given by uh, General William Sherman that said 
that uh, speaking here uh, about uh, formerly enslaved African American families in this area of uh, the coastal land in, in, in Georgia and South Carolina, the, the order said, each family shall have a plot of not more than 40 acres of tillable ground, in the possession of which land the military authorities will afford them protection until such time as they can protect themselves or until Congress shall regulate their title. And this military order, special field orders number 15, is a kind of origin point for a phrase that is still commonly uh, thrown around in, in discussions of, of, of reparations. This, this idea of 40 acres and a mule uh, being owed to uh, formerly enslaved African Americans. And of course, these 40 acres were not ever provided. Um, this order was uh, repealed shortly after it was given uh, by President Andrew Johnson. And while the federal government did take on an active role in uh, supporting uh, you know, the economic efforts of uh, formerly enslaved people for a brief period of time in, in the sort of radical reconstruction period, uh, that never involved uh, a kind of land redistribution program that had sort of initially been, been uh, sketched out in this order. Um, so if, if that's kind of the, the old origin point of the movement for reparations, it also has a, a modern story um, that I think is maybe um, even more relevant to, to thinking about it today. Um, and that modern story really picks up in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, and one of the most central and important figures involved in this is a woman named Audley Moore, um, who's pictured here on my slide, uh, who is uh, often referred to as the Queen Mother, Audley Moore. And Audley Moore was uh, born in Louisiana, uh, grew up there. Uh, her, she was involved with um, Marcus Garvey's uh, movement uh, as a young person, and then became very involved in a number of civil rights and black power organizations in the 1950s and 60s. And she was very influential in trying to frame a wide variety of different demands around this idea of reparations, around this idea of um, using the, the history of enslavement and, and racial oppression as a, as a kind of way of thinking about all kinds of different proposals in the present. And so she was involved in an organization that advocated for welfare rights, for instance, uh, for black women. And rather than trying to frame these, these, these welfare rights in terms of um, you know, a government handout as they were often criticized as in the past, she was saying, no, we should see uh, welfare rights in the present as a, a debt that is owed um, as a result of this history. And so she was really kind of the, the in some ways, the driving force uh, behind uh, the sort of uptick of discussions uh, around reparations in, in that period uh, that we, we so associate with um, black activism and, uh, and, and, and all kinds of uh, Sort of political here. Fiddle. Um, and so her work uh, is, is actually a kind of connection between uh, this, this older history and, and, and the present day as well. Um, some of you might, might be aware of uh, a bill um, that uh, was debated in Congress in a couple, just a couple of years ago. Um, and this was the bill HR 40. And it was a bill to study and develop proposals about reparations for Black Americans. Um, and it was reintroduced in the 2017-18 um, after having been initially introduced in 1989 uh, by, the, uh, by the Congressman John Conyers. And when this bill was initially introduced in, in 1989, um, one of the groups that was sort of pressuring uh, Conyers to introduce it was, you know, a group called the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. Um, acronym is, is NCOBRA. And Audley Moore had actually mentored a lot of the folks involved in this organization and um, sort of been a part of, of its proposals. Um, so there's a kind of connection between this longer story and some of the, the conversations around reparations that have become, I think, a bit more prominent um, in, in recent years. Um, okay, so why, 
why is it important to, to know this? Well, for me, it's helpful to kind of know some of this, you know, this arc of, of, of the history uh, because it, it helps me at least think of reparations not as a kind of free floating idea or a free floating demand, but as a kind of tradition. There's a tradition of, of thinking about this and there is a, a movement that has debated it, uh, pushed it forward at various points in American history. Um, and, and sort of understanding that there are connections between these moments, I think puts it in a different context than, than simply saying, well, are you for or against it, right? It, it shows it a kind of tradition with a lot of internal debates and layers uh, within it. So I'm gonna talk now about a couple of these debates within the reparations movement. Um, one of the, you know, the immediate questions that, that comes up when you, you talk about um, reparations for, uh, for African-Americans is the question of sort of who, who, is, do, who is making whatever kind of, 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 of payment or whatever kind of economic uh, redistribution is involved in this, who is it coming from? Is it coming from the state or is it coming from you know, civil society organizations, private, um, private funding and things like that? And this has been a debate within, within the movement um, that has uh, sought reparations going back a long ways. Um, and in fact, this, this debate has, has sometimes even brought churches to the forefront of reparations conversations. Um, and perhaps the most um, striking or, um, yeah, perhaps the most, the most striking moment uh, where, where the, the question of reparations really even broke onto to the national scene in the 1960s involved a church. Um, and this uh, was a moment in 1969 when uh, a civil rights activist named James Foreman, who uh, had been a leader in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee um, in the South in the early 1960s, disrupted a church service at Riverside Church on May 4th, 1969. He disrupted the service um, and, and came to the pulpit and, and, and read uh, a document called the Black Manifesto. And this document uh, was the product of a conference that had occurred a couple weeks earlier in Detroit that involved a lot of uh, important sort of civil rights and black power figures. And Foreman demanded uh, that churches uh, make a contribution to uh, to repairing the damages that he saw uh, from both slavery and, 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 and post-emancipation racial oppression. So I put just there a, a quotation, which gives you a sense of kind of the, um, the, 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 the force of, of, of Foreman's rhetoric um, in this moment. Um, but I think one of the questions that the, this moment raised for a lot of people was, you know, why churches? Why, why are we focusing on, on churches? Why not? focus more on, on the state. Um, and so Foreman had a kind of twofold answer to this question. Um, for Foreman, one of the reasons to, to focus on, on the churches and perhaps to focus more broadly on sort of civil society was that that was a way of sort of denying the state the power to arbitrate black freedom in the United States. It, it, it denied that the, you know, that the, that the, that the government would be the sort of defining force in, um, in, in this movement. And another reason for it, um, which uh, comes up here, uh, uh, in, even in the quote that I've, I've given a bit, is that you know, for, for Foreman, there was a kind of um, an inter intertwining of you know, many Christian churches and, and ideological justifications for the transatlantic slave trade in earlier centuries, and that this was one reason why why he focused on the churches. Um, so I think I think this moment is 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 it's a really fascinating story, and and there's sort of lots you can you can read about it. But I wanted to just highlight it because it is a moment sort of within this long tradition, within this long movement, where um, where churches were actually sort of at the forefront of of the discussion. Um, so if one divide or one debate within the reparations movement is about sort of whether the state or civil society should sort of be the central institutional um, 
target of, of, of reparations demands. Another question has to do with whether the reparations um, are imagined to be for the history of, of slavery or for um, post-emancipation forms of, of racial oppression, um, or you know, perhaps the two together. And in, in this debate, uh, one of the things that has become really central um, has actually been uh, the question of housing. Um, so, so for those activists and, and thinkers who think about reparations not just being um, a kind of compensation for the history of slavery, but also uh, a way to repair you know, the ongoing damages of, um, of racial inequality after emancipation, um, housing has become a really central uh, part of that conversation. Um, and some of you may have read or, or, or may remember um, when it came out the, this article by, by Ta-Nehisi Coates um, called The Case for Reparations that, that came out, um, gosh, I think seven, seven years ago now maybe. Um, and, and this article was often discussed as though it were about uh, the case for reparations for slavery. But Coates actually mostly talked about um, housing discrimination and, uh, and, and in particular this, this practice called redlining. Um, that had been uh, part of, uh, of how African-Americans were denied equal access to housing for many years. Um, and so, uh, so what was redlining? Uh, well, redlining was uh, something that, that uh, emerged in the 1930s um, when uh, a new organization called the Homeowners Loan Corporation was founded. Uh, it was founded in the midst of a depression um, as you know, foreclosures were on the rise and it was a really important organization for um, you know, stabilizing the housing market. But it also um, entrenched forms of segregation and, and racial inequality through a very kind of visual system of dividing up cities uh, on the basis of their supposed desirability for mortgage lenders. Um, and so the red areas mm -hmm. of cities uh, all across the country. And I've, I've provided here a, a map of the East Bay. Um, so this is mostly um, sections of, of, of Oakland, but, but just at the top there, I think we get into to Berkeley and the map goes up further um, towards, uh, towards the, the surrounding areas. Um, you have you know, tracts of land uh, that are sort of co color coded on the basis of you know, what was seen as a kind of safe investment for mortgage lenders. And those areas color-coded red uh, were described as hazardous. Um, and so it was a way for this government organization to essentially say, you know, this is a, this is a place where we're not likely to make, um, to make a loan, um, or this is a place where, uh, you know, private lenders should also be very wary of, of making loans. And these red areas in, in Oakland and, and all throughout the country um, were often the predominantly African American um, areas of, of these cities. Um, and so one consequence of this was that it was much harder for um, Black Americans to gain uh, home loans. And as we know, um, you know, yeah. home ownership has become such a central part of the ability to, um, you know, amass economic security and, and wealth in this country that this is seen as one of the main driving forces behind you know, present day gaps in, uh, in, in wealth between white and black Americans. Um, so you know, that, that question, that debate about sort of, you know, should this focus on slavery or should this focus on sort of post-emancipation forms of, of racial inequality um, has really brought in this question of, of housing as well. Um, a third really important debate and divide that I just wanna kind of just highlight uh, but but since you know I'm, I'm uh, I want to be conscious of the time I'm not going to talk about uh, another uh, another big div divide and debate has been about you know whether the folks who are um, are seen as sort of the recipients of whatever kind of reparations proposal is is made should be you know U.S. descendants of of American slaves or uh, or you know involve also um, African and Caribbean immigrants that that maybe you know weren't uh, you know tied to the specific system 
of, of, um, of enslavement that, that occurred within this country. And this has become an important debate, especially um, in, in, in recent years. And, and for obvious reasons, it would connect back to the other debate about you know, whether this is a way of thinking about sort of repairing the damage of, of slavery or also repairing the post-slavery history of uh, racial inequality and oppression. Because of course, um, migrants who, who, who may not have, have had uh, ancestors involved in um, the, the, you know, the system of, of, of slavery within the United States would then still have, have you know, suffered many of the, the harms of, of, of post-emancipation racial inequality. Okay, so those are kind of three of the big debates, I guess, within the reparations movement. But I wanna spend a couple minutes also talking about a few arguments um, against the idea of reparations. Um, there are many arguments out there against the idea of reparations. Um, and uh, you know, the most prominent of them, um, I think are, 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 are not arguments that are, are, I find particularly compelling to think through um, often. Um, but there are, I think, several arguments against reparations that I think are really valuable to, to, to think about and, and consider. Um, arguments that, that might come from progressives or from the left that um, you know, see reparations as, as, as perhaps something that's valuable, but perhaps the wrong um, way of, of achieving a, a more just society. Um, so I'm gonna talk just sort of about two of these, these uh, big arguments that I think are really, really important and, and worth, worth thinking through. Um, so, so one sort of argument from, uh, from progressives uh, about uh, why reparations is sort of not the best way, way forward um, poses reparations sort of against the idea of, of, of advocating for universal programs of social provisioning. So this might be programs of, of universal health care, uh, universal education, um, you know, wage increases and, and, and so forth that are posed as, as not, uh, not as in terms of reparations, but as, uh, as just sort of universal benefits. And this argument, um, I think, really has kind of three components. Uh, one is that advocates of, of this position often say, well, you know, Black Americans, uh, are such a large component of the working class that they're going to stand to gain the most from universal programs anyway. And so, you know, if we advocate for for these programs and and we succeed in, um, you know, in, in instantiating them, then we're going to sort of achieve more of a benefit for the the community that reparations is targeted at in the first place. Another component of this argument is that reparations kind of presuppose a, a unitary black community that sort of overlooks. Um, the diversity among African Americans, uh, and that might uh, also overlook class divisions within uh, the, the, the African American community. And then the third component of this argument is that, you know, it might be more difficult to build a coalition um, around uh, a demand for reparations that's seen as more divisive than it would be um, to build a coalition around some kind of universal program of, of, of social benefit. So that's, I think, one sort of very important subset of, of arguments against reparations. Another important subset, which I, is, is somewhat tied to that, that, that first one, um, has to do with you know, how we think about the relationship between justice and history. And this argument often takes the form of, of, of the question, you know, why look backward rather than looking forward? Why would we, why would we not sort of if we're trying to build a, a just society, um, try to imagine what that just society would look like from our present position and try to work towards it, um, rather than looking to you know, repair harms from the past. Because of course, there are so many of those, uh, those harms from the past. And, and we, we sort of only have uh, the, the time before us to, to build a better world. And so in, in, in academic circles, sometimes this uh, argument is, is, is framed around these terms of reparative justice versus distributive justice. Um, and so the distributive justice position often sort of takes as a baseline the current society and tries to imagine um, a, a, a future without recourse to, to thinking about, um, about the past necessarily. Um, okay, so those I think are, are two very important arguments um, that uh, 
that have been have, have been leveled against sort of the the idea of of of, of reparations um, from a kind of progressive standpoint um, in in recent years. And I, I'm just going to close by by talking a, a, to, by returning to this notion of reparations as a kind of tradition and as a framework rather than as a kind of you know single position or single demand. Um, hopefully what some of you know the the history i've sketched out here has has shown has been that the the black reparations movement in this country um has had a lot of flexibility and creativity in it it has made a number of different proposals um it has focused on a number of different sort of specific areas of our uh, social and economic life um, and it hasn't sort of been a single ready-made plan and demand. Um, and, and what I think is, is interesting to, to think about when you think about reparations as a kind of tradition and as a kind of framework is that it, it, it raises, I think, broad questions that we might all think about um, a lot more. Um, questions like who owes what to whom? We're, we're living in a time when our economy is so centered around debt that people owe each other um, or people owe the bank um, all kinds of, 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 of property and, and money. And, and, and framing um, different, uh, different demands, different uh, movements as, as kind of designed around this idea of reparations um, sort of flips that a little bit and says, you know, well, who really owes what to whom in, in this society. And um, as a result, I think it, uh, it, it sort of enables us to think a little bit about you know, what we all um, owe each other. Um, so I'll just kind of close on, on, on that note. Um, I hope this has been um, uh, interesting and, and happy to take some, some questions as well. So thank you everybody for, for listening. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, that was really really helpful and um yeah i like we saw at the beginning we have folks on this zoom from danville and arinda and first church berkeley and arlington up in kensington as well as maybe some other places and you know we're all starting this this work of um the black home ownership reparations fund and you know, maybe some of us have been thinking about reparations for a long time. Maybe some of us are just starting to educate ourselves. Um, I'm certainly early on in my, uh, my own learning about this, but I think what you've said has uh, really helped us kind of put this offering that we're doing for Lent in context. Um, so thank you. And um, I, I, I wonder if we could just open it up uh, to see if anybody has some questions now um, directly on what Sam said, some of the history that he gave us, um, or if you want to try to tie it into what, uh, what our churches are doing um, during this Lenten offering as well. So if you do have a question, I'd love it if you would just raise your hand and I would, I would try to find you on our screen and I'll call on you. Okay. Yeah, Michael and Elizabeth. Okay, you, right. okay. I would just like to ask Sam if he has any insights as to what lessons we can learn from the Japanese reparations that were offered to the internees by the federal government. Is there anything that those reparations can teach us? Thank you. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And and for those of you who, who, who don't know, there was, um, right, uh, a sort of uh, recognizing the the horrors of, of, of Japanese internment during the Second World War, an effort to sort of make um, make restitution um, for for that policy. Um, I mean, I, I don't know that I have a. Um, I, I guess one lesson I think we could learn is just that that it, it might put the idea of reparations more in the realm of of political or uh, social possibility, um, knowing that this has been done um, in in other times and places um, for various things. Um, there have been uh, in, in other countries as well, uh, sort of modes of, uh, of, of, of reparations. There's um, a, a large program in, in Australia uh, trying to make reparations uh, to uh, the indigenous population there. There have, uh, you know, there have been 
uh, those in, in, in Germany for the Holocaust and other, other things like that. So I don't know that I have a specific lesson to learn other than that, you know, looking at some of these other examples might make folks realize that, you know, this, this thing, this idea that might seem, you know, extremely, uh, extremely a kind of over the moon idea um, might actually be, be something that, you know, if there was a will behind it could be um, achieved in some fashion. Uh, I see Charles with a with a hand up for a question. And Charles, make sure you're unmuted. Meant to do that. Thank you. Um, one pattern that has been pursued in in a number of country, countries, I think, of South Africa uh, primarily, uh, is is that of uh, truth and reconciliation, and. Uh, Part of, the, part of the issue there, particularly for South Africa, but I think it's applicable to, uh, to the United States, <clears throat> is the vast amount of time that is involved, uh, particularly in relation to slavery, but uh, beyond slavery uh, with the Jim Crow issues in the South and more currently, as you illustrated with the housing issues. Um, and there's a whole process of learning that uh, Nate has talked about that I think we all need to engage in, but the, the degree of, of lack of awareness. Uh, I, I read Donahisi Coates' uh, article in The Atlantic uh, all those years ago, and I was stunned because much of this is history that I lived through but had no idea of. Um, and I'm, I'm doing a lot to educate myself now, but uh, I wonder if the reparations argument uh, is seen in the context of a truth and reconciliation uh, discussion uh, over time. Yeah, I think um, it's a great <laughs> point. I, I, I would just sort of echo that, that absolutely. It, it seems to me that this process of, of, of learning and, um, and, and I should say, I'm, I'm certainly not coming at this from a, an expert perspective, <laughs> exactly. I've, I've done some, some study myself and, and tried to learn about it as well. But, um, but yeah, I would, I would say, you know, in, in, the, in the contemporary context, I think those two have often been linked um, in, in thinking about, um, you know, a, a kind of reparative justice approach more broadly. So absolutely. And I'll just follow up on that. I was interested in that criticism that you brought in of, you know, distinguishing between reparative justice and distributive justice. And, you know, because distributive justice, like I'm all for that, that sounds really good. Um, but it seems like that would be a kind of weak distributive justice that wasn't aware of the past or the context of, of where we are now, right? Um, I don't, I don't know, maybe that's not a question, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, well, that, that's what a lot of the, the, the folks on the other side of that argument often will say is, well, you know, it's nice to think that we could imagine a, a more just society. And I think that's a really worthy goal, um, but would we be able to achieve it without also at the same time reckoning with some of the reasons why we're not a just society now? Um, and I think that's exactly kind of what that argument tends to, to kind of hinge on. Helen. Yeah, just to piggyback on that, um, I fear a huge backlash unless we do the restorative, I'm sorry, unless we do the truth and reconciliation piece uh, towards educating folks. I mean, if we didn't know it and we sort of consider ourselves progressives, look at all the people that are way behind us in learning what has happened over the last 400 years and who don't recognize it. So I, I think that piece of the recognizing what has gone badly in this country, educating people is absolutely critical before the country would do any buy-in towards any of these ways of 
restoring justice. Yeah. And um, some of you probably saw that one of the last things that came out of the Trump administration was that, um, what was that called, Sam? That little kind of booklet that was a response to the 1619 project? Yes, it had the very catchy name of the 1776 project. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And it was like the last couple days of the administration. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think what that was, was it's not just that there's forgetting, but there's alternative there's alternative stories being told at the same time. There's, there's competing narratives, um, which is maybe another argument for being really clear about what our story is and where our role is in this. Yeah, and I would just say, in, in, I think Helen's, in response to, to Helen's point and that point as well is that, right, I think, I think one of the things that I have learned from reading about and, and studying the reparations movement is that it has been a movement that is always invested in kind of retelling the story of the country, right? It, it, it is sort of through its framing of, of, of things like, you know, of, of things like welfare rights as a kind of, of reparation, it's making a kind of claim about sort of what the country's arc has been that is often, um, often sort of in, in, in contrast to the stories that are, are sort of most often and most loudly told. Uh, I see a question from uh, Mary Howe Grant. Hi, Mary. Yes. I'm, I'm, uh, I attend First Congregational Church in Santa Barbara, where Dennis uh, cool. preaches. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. I would just, I, I totally agree with Helen that we need to do the work of truth and reconciliation, but I would hesitate to want to do that completely first in the sense that I think universal healthcare is an important, very important program that should not necessarily be tied to reparations and needs to be enacted. And I, and I think that comes before anything else. Thanks for that, Mary. That's, that's a issue dear to my heart as well. Um, Doug, I see you have a question. Doug has been leading, is that a social justice group at Danville? Is that right, Doug? Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. So my question is really two part question. Um, has there been any successful legislation either at the state or federal level for uh, reparations for black Americans? And the other part is can you give us some examples of significant reparations uh, efforts uh, from faith-based groups? Hmm. Wonderful questions, um, Doug, thank you for those. So um, there hasn't been, I mean, at the federal level, uh, something that has been sort of framed in this way and, and that has been successful. And the, the bill that I mentioned sort of earlier on in, in my, my presentation, um, is, is not even a, a bill to sort of enact um, a particular reparation proposal. It's a, it's a bill to develop a commission to study and make proposals for reparations. And that has also not passed. Um, at the state and local level, I'm, I'm not certain. Um, I, I, there aren't any that I know of, but that does not at all mean that there aren't any. Um, and and I, would, I would imagine that um, perhaps in, in recent, in even just this year or, the, or last year, um, some of the, the work that's been done at, at state levels surrounding, um, you know, Confederate monuments and other things like that um, might have been framed in, in, in that way um, in, 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 some, in some fashion, but that is, is kind of a speculative um, guess. Um, so uh, the other question was about, about faith-based organizations. Well, I mean, the, the one example that I, I really do know a bit about is that is the um, the Black Manifesto example. Um, and, and there were actual denominational responses. Um, this, uh, there was a, a group um, called the Interreligious, I'm gonna get it wrong, but the, the acronym is IFCO. It was, I think the Interreligious, um, I don't know, foundation or community organizations or, or something. And they were involved with 
um, the the conference, the, the the National Black Economic Development Conference, that sort of spawned that uh, that uh, that document and 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 Foreman's demand. Um, and and while they were certainly uh, came nowhere close to the 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 demand of of, of five hundred million dollars. Um, and, and, and it should also be said that Foreman's sort of spectacular presentation of this by disrupting a, a service at Riverside Church um, also made him a lot of enemies. Um, it, there were so, certain sort of denominational um, contributions um, in, in the aftermath of, of, of that um, that I am aware of. I, I don't sort of know right off the top of my head sort of what the numbers were, um, but I, I, rem I, I remember reading about, you know, certain, certain uh, different churches um, making contributions uh, to, to that effort. And Doug, just to follow up on that, um, this is now a growing movement, at least in the United Church of Christ, if not other denominations. Um, there was a video, a webinar that the UCC put out um, two weeks ago, maybe, um, and it's about church-based reparations. I really recommend it if people haven't seen it. Um, I know I've sent it out among my people at ACC, um, if you just search UCC church-based reparations on YouTube, you should be able to find it. And it's a conversation between a few pastors and conference ministers who have started this project um, in similar ways as, as we are all doing right here in the East Bay, um, uh, either through establishing funds or um, yeah, exploring other ways to promote black wealth. Um, so. That's one of the amazing things about how this is all coming, coming up to me, which to me is you know, a suggestion at least of God's grace in this process is that a whole bunch of different churches undertook some sort of anti-racist work last summer. And now, you know, uh, almost a year ahead, you know, we're seeing some of the fruits of that work. And I'm, I'm hoping that it's the beginning of something right now as well. Um, do we have a few other other questions or thoughts? Maybe from some other people we haven't heard from. I'm doing my best to scan the windows. Uh, Dorothy, I see you with your hand up. And you'll have to unmute, yeah. Yeah, bad time for me to unmute. I have a telephone ringing in my ear. That's okay. Um, we'll ignore that until it is picked up. It's okay now. Sorry. Um, I, I know that we're here to talk about black reparations, but I'm concerned about Native American needs. Have, has there been any similar kind of, of um, development or movement in that? That's a wonderful question. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, there have been certainly um, movements uh, for for Native American reparations. Um, they've often, you know, also used different terminologies for for sovereignty in particular um, has been a kind of central demand. Um, but 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 yes, absolutely. Um, and and those movements have sometimes intersected with the the with with black movements for for reparations. Um, there were. Again, looking back at this period in, in the sort of late later 1960s, some sort of connections across these different groups at, at times, but they've also often been on uh, on sort of di divergent or, or or simply parallel uh, paths. Uh, but I think that's an extremely important issue um, as as well. Uh, one one thing that I've heard come up um, from people who are thinking about this is, you know. Is there a risk to, to focusing on one group or one issue? And you know, are we risking leaving other groups uh, behind? You know, and it, it seems to me that it might just be the opposite. That you know, if groups uh, groups like ours undertook uh, a focus on reparations for one group of people that have been harmed or damaged in the past, that might lead to considerations for other groups as well. Um, I don't know if anyone has a, has a thought about that. It's sort of like a scarcity versus an abundance type model. Um, I, could, I could see it going either way, right? 
Um, Tom Dean, I see you with your hand up. Can you hear me now? Okay. I had a follow up to, I was thinking to, uh, on the point Nate just made. Is it, it's just, it's an observation and a question, I guess. To me, it seems important that a group like ACC do something, <laughs> you know, I, if, if, and if that leads to a bigger project in the church or in this community or in the state or in the world, if we start somewhere, at least we start, as opposed to, we seem to be almost nowhere on like getting national legislation and state legislation, as you've said. So that's, that's both my question following up to Navy. Do you see that as worthwhile, even on a very small basis? And do you see any hope down the road for a larger effort nationwide or statewide even? Hmm. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Sam, do you have a thought about that? Yeah, so that's for both of you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I would. I would say. Uh, I, I think. I think that's kind of exactly right. I mean, I, I don't think that there's a, a lot of um, hope in the in the kind of immediate term for for this to to make progress on on that kind of um, federal legislative level. Um, or, or even state levels as well. But it, it seems to me that the, the mechanism towards broader transformations, um, as it has always been, is, is sort of smaller groups of people starting where they are um, and, and making the moves that they can. And, oh, and, and Mary, I, did, I just looked it up, your, your question in the chat about whether William Coffin was the senior minister. He was not, um, he, uh, he was a little bit later. It was uh, Ernest Campbell was the senior minister at the time. And, and I think Ernest Campbell did preach a sermon called The Case for Reparations just a few weeks after James Foreman's protest. Yes. So he took it seriously right away. He preached on that uh, Zacchaeus story from the Gospel of Luke, um, tax collector who gives away his money. Um, we might have time for, for one or two more thoughts or questions, if we have any. Uh, Mary, I see you with your hand up again, yeah. I would just highly recommend the UCC reparations uh, YouTube video. The three churches or the two churches in Princeton Theological, which are already involved in this process, have done a lot of looking at their own history and then making decisions upon reparations from there. And they recommend that as the very first step. And I mean, really going back and digging. That's great, thank you. And um, Kit Dunbar very helpfully found that video. So it's in the chat right now. So if you just scroll up in the chat, you'll see a YouTube link and um, you can click on that. Um, and, and that is the exact video that we were talking about. Um, maybe I'll just, I'll just linger on this one point that was really meaningful to me is this notion of reparations as a way to help us retell uh, some of the stories about our country. Um, one thing I was struck by in, in being part of my church in the wake of um, what happened on January 6th, you know, the, the violence and the uprising at the Capitol was all this kind of work we were having to do about like reacting to the national, the stories we told ourselves about our country and, you know, a lot, some people came out and said, some leaders of our country came out and said, well, this is not America, right? This is not who we are. Um, but, you know, one thing I heard um, one person in my church say very soon after that was, no, this is part of who we are, you know? This is and has been part of our history um, since the beginning. And, you know, we can talk about legislation and, and actions, but I think for me as a storyteller, as a minister, changing some of the narratives um, 
is just as important and, and maybe more possible on a kind of small congregational level. So that's one thing that interests me about this idea of reparations is how it changes some of the narratives we tell. Um, Charles, I see you with your hand up. Yeah. Um, one of the things, I mean, I agree with what you just said that, that um, but I, I, I also think that it's, that when I think of reparations and going back to, to also what Mary Howe Grant said, uh, the whole idea of reparations tends to focus on money that we've got to find the money to give to people. But the whole idea of housing and healthcare and those things are separate. And there's a big part of reparations, which is what's in the heart. That the space for the spirit of forgiveness, the sphere, spirit of um, seeking apology is very key to healing. And to do that, you have to be able, we as a, as a people have to be able to both acknowledge and apologize and be accepted for that, for that healing to happen. And a lot of reparations is really tied up in my mind that, that that aspect of it is overlooked very frequently and that the, the money is a, is a piece of it that gets the attention, it gets, it gets people tied up in knots, but the really bigger part is moving into an understanding and a, a space of, of acknowledgement and, and so on. And out of that can really come a, a healing, but but these issues of housing and so on stand independently, and they need to be fully uh, healthcare and, and and so on. Uh, breaking down of the redlining, all of those things are things that that have to be pursued, but they can be best pursued when this other process is going on of healing. I really appreciate that, Charles. Uh, Tom, I see your I, hand. It's not, I have a question. I, maybe I missed it because I came late. Sam, where do you teach? Where do you oh, teach? Great question. Um, so I, 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 Nate mentioned I'm, I'm living in Washington, DC. I'm actually virtually teaching at Columbia University this year. Um, but yeah, yeah. Okay, who's older? Nate is older. <laughs> <laughs> How much, it can't be much. <laughs> no, Nate. Just a couple of years, three years. <laughs> He's three years older. Okay. <laughs> now we've covered the important topics. <laughs> yeah, you always. Thanks like again. Thanks, Sam. I really appreciate Tom, really appreciate your talk. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much for for welcoming me welcoming me into the to this community. It's it's wonderful work you're doing, and it's great to to um, yeah to be here for for a little bit. Thank you, Sam. That was really, really wonderful. We really appreciate it. Thanks to everybody for joining this call. It's really inspiring to see people from um, Santa Barbara and, um, like I said, Danville, Arinda, and even some folks from back in Boston, Massachusetts. So uh, really great to see you all. Let me just say a quick prayer to close us out this afternoon, okay? O oh God of love and justice and forgiveness and healing. We thank you, God, for bringing us together um, as churches, as individuals, um, all of whom are on a journey. We thank you, God, for putting this, uh, this topic, this issue, this theme, this new way of telling stories. We thank you for putting this before us during this Lenten season. We ask God that, yes, we would raise some money that would help make a difference in the lives of Black families in the East Bay. 
We ask God that we might give a little more and dig a little deeper than we thought we would at the beginning. But we also ask God that in this giving, uh, in this fundraising, we might be changed, that we might be healed. And in a small way, uh, we might start something that continues and grows well beyond us. We thank you, God. We pray in your holy name. Amen. All right, my friends. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you so bye. much. Thanks, Sam.